today and under the guidance of me as the president of college, Dr. Malakanti Galhin, Dr. Achini and Dr. Jolika uh, was my registrars. So uh, when they were doing uh, the clinical training, uh, the important interest cases that we selected, and the, after the case discussion, we are going to provide you the better knowledge about how to manage guideline management and how to manage people with uh, the, uh, the same diagnosis. This is, I think, second or third program in such a way. One week we are doing guideline management. The next uh, week we discuss the uh, OSCE case scenario. Today is, last time we did the OSCE case scenario. Today is, uh, you know, the uh, according to the, accordingly the guideline management session uh, on the basis of case-based discussion. So it's, first of all, Achini is going to uh, provide her, uh, give her the, uh, discuss the case scenario and she comes to that and the rest of that, the important other, you know, the knowledge that will be given, uh, supplementary knowledge will be given by Dr. Cholika, right? So this will be continued every Thursday. Last time we postponed because of the, uh, because of our, uh, you know, the me meeting that we were uh, planning to held at the Marriott Hotel. So it's apologies for that. And today we'll start it. Okay. Uh, Achini, it's over to you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, madam. Today mm -hmm. I am. Can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. Yes, today I am going to discuss about the practical approach to management of osteoporosis. First, I, I am going to discuss a clinical scenario. While we were practicing our clinic at Base Hospital Panadura with Madam Malkanti Galhena, then some definitions I am going to discuss, then about the risk factors of osteoporosis, risk assessment, and how to manage osteoporosis. My patient is a 57-year-old female, mother of three children, came complaining of back pain for two weeks. She has had this back, back pain on gradual onset for two years and she has had on and off attacks. This time, she has aggravated the symptoms for two weeks. The pain is aching type and moderate intensity, no radiation. It was persistent throughout the day and aggravated with movements and relieved with rest. She had no nocturnal pain, no history of any trauma, no morning stiffness, no fever, no pain in other joints. She had no loss of weight, appetite and sleep was normal. She had no urinary symptoms, bowel habits were normal. She had no numbness or weakness of legs, no urinary or bowel incontinence. She has had no chronic cough or contact history of tuberculosis. She ha had no history of accidents or injuries just prior to this episode of back pain. She had no symptoms of uterovaginal prolapse. She has had no history of TB, any malignancies, urinary calculi or arthritis. Past, medical, past surgical history was not significant. She has not undergone any surgeries. She was on, not on any drugs like corticosteroids, thyroxine, antipsychotics, proton pump inhibitors like drugs. She had no any allergies. Uh, her gynecological history, she has had menopause at 40 years of age and HRT was not given for early menopause. Uh, her family history, her mother had a pelvic fracture at the age of 50 years. According to the history, it was a fragile fracture. Social history, she was non-alcoholic, non-smoker. She lives with her husband and three children are married and they live separately. 
she has difficulty to perform day to day activities due to the back pain and she has worrying thoughts about the functional impairment but she has no features suggestive of depression on examination on general examination she was not pale not febrile no thyroid enlargement examination of the spine no kyphosis or scoliosis no any tender points on the back uh, no muscle spasms no sacroiliac joint tenderness gait was normal both upper limbs and lower limbs sensory motor and reflexes were normal cardiovascular system respiratory system and abdominal examination was normal these are the investigations we did full blood count hemoglobin was 12.5 wbc count was 7 platelet count was 351 and esr was 15 Uh, and we have we did x-ray lumbar spine it was uh, in the x-ray bone density was low and there were no fractures and no deformities these are the x-rays and dexa scan lumbar spine t score uh, was uh, minus 2.6 this is the dexa scan report and we calculated the fracture risk assessment according to the frax tool this is how we assess uh, fra fracture risk we have we have to enter the date of the patient age is 57 female weight is 51 height is 151 she had no previous fractures she had a parent with fractured hip not current smoking no current glucocorticoid treatment no rheumatoid arthritis secondary osteoporosis yes, because early menopause not treated not alcoholic bmd was 0.71 so we calculated the Ten year probability of fracture. It is seventeen percent for major osteoporotic fracture. So we enter the data into this graph. The age is fifty five, fifty seven, and major osteoporotic fracture is is seventeen percent. So she falls into the very high risk group. So this is the pharmacological management we did. We gave allantoin acid seventy milligram mane weekly, and advised on how to take and about side effects were given. Counsel calcium lactate and vitamin D we gave, and we plan to assess regularly. This is the non-pharmacological management we did. we counsel the patient about the disease and about the treatment and about the side effects of the drugs then back discipline advice on adequate nutrition calcium vitamin d and high protein diet fall risk assessment and fall prevention advised on muscle strengthening exercises health education about the disease and complications safety netting about the disease and about the drug side effects and education of family members first we want then i'll go on to the discussion of management of osteoporosis the clinical significance of osteoporosis lies in the fractures that can arise Approximately one in two adult women and one in five men will sustain one or more fracture fractures in their lifetime. So it is quite a large number. So we Can have. Shall I disturb a little? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You know, okay, the, according to the case, right? Uh, case uh, that we uh, we identified, the patient was diagnosed as uh, osteoporosis with high risk. Fracture risk through frac score, right? And the risk falls risk assessment also high. So because of that, we educated 
very well about the prevention of the, the, the disease, about the disease, what osteoporosis means, that is the softening of bones, which the patient can't, you know, the, get the, 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 the normal forces to go through that. So because of that, to prevention of osteoporotic fractures should be the focus for us. And we have adequately, you know, the uh, discussed with her and gave the knowledge in order to uh, ID uh, the get to know the health risks to you know the uh, get these fractures. In case if she get fracture, no point of managing us this patient because this is high time that being the family physician, we have to know how to prevent this patient going into fracture. So the forceful, you know, the weight uh, lifting and as well as you know, the heavy exercise and all, right? We have to, we must uh, ask the patient to stop these and the special back discipline need to be, uh, you know, the uh, conveyed to this patient in order to get the training. So that is not to weight lift through, you know, the straight, uh, you know, they're like carrying weights and doing heavy work while you know the without bending the neck uh, the sorry the back and you know with we, we advise her to bend not bend the knees whenever she lift and avoid as much as possible also and the other things management that Ajini told so having that we need to know you all being registrars to at the exam and as well as in your patient management you should always you know the stick to the guideline management not just here and there right so you have to have your guideline management on the back of your head whenever you are getting a patient because then only you are safe and then only you are in par with standards with other specialists right where you need to you know the talk about your patients being family physicians you should not think that we are behind we are equal as you know, the other specialist, right? Recognized by the Ministry of Health. So our management, we have to know the red flag. So because of that, our knowledge matters even between death. So because of that, you have to know the, uh, the guideline management. That is the rationale behind that. Achini is going to discuss about you. She told you how to identify the osteoporotic patient by the history right part the history of you know, the back pain the quality of back pain as well as the patient uh, family history of uh, fracture risk right and the dexa scans uh, support you for that to come to the diagnosis all together and excluding other possible red flag diseases which gives rise to the osteoporosis you know the like hyperthyroidism then type 2 type 1 diabetes uh, and some you know the uh, uh, arthropathies, those things are there. So my exclusion of that only, you can come to the old age. This is pre-menopausal, you know, the osteoporosis. Early menopause, this lady had gone into menopause at 45 five years of age and with that she has developed. So the menopause is the common, you know, the cause to develop osteoporosis in a lady. So this is postmenopausal osteoporosis with strong mm -hmm. family history. That is why her fracture risk is very high. So now you have to know how do you identify such patients? How do you manage such patients according to the guideline? Because we can't do here and there. So actually now it's over to you to provide that knowledge to your colleagues. Okay. Carry on. So the clinical significance of osteoporosis lies in the fractures <laughs> that can arise. <laughs> Approximately one in two adult women and one in five men will sustain one or more fragile fractures in their lifetime. This is the WHO definition of osteoporosis. It is a progressive systemic skeletal disease characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue with a consequent increase in bone fragility. Uh, we can't measure the bone mass. Uh, clinically, so we uh, use the bone mineral density of bone scan T score. It, if it is less than minus 2.5, it is uh, very susceptible to fracture. Uh, definition of fragility fracture is a low trauma fracture sustained from a fall from standing height or less. 
is for compares bone mineral density of the subject with the young adult mean that is 30 year of age and ESET score compares bone mineral density of the subject to an age matched normal control. These are the diagnostic thresholds according to the T score. Normal T score is more than minus 1 or minus 1. Osteopenia range is minus 1 to minus 2.5. If it is minus 2.5 or more, it is categorized as osteoporosis. These are the common sites of fragility fractures. They are vertebral bodies, hip, distal radius, proximal humerus, and pelvis. This graph shows peak bone mass, uh, how it differs according to the age. You can see this uh, red line is female and blue line is men and up to the age of 30 both male and female peak bone mass increase increase rapidly and then it comes to a plateau then it decreases gradually both male and female at the age of menopause it falls rapidly and again gradual bone loss can be seen at any age, uh, you can see uh, peak bone mass of males are higher than females. This red area is called the fracture zone. You can see now, females enter the fracture zone very early in their life. Kindly mute your phones, microphones, please. It's noise are coming. Please not. Please mute your microphones. Yeah, like, okay. Like that and stay in my Can't you hear? Yeah, no, Please mute your microphones. You early morning and uh, when come in the evening. Oh. Someone is you know, the disturbing. So please ah, mute hear. your microphone. Hello. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Then I'll discuss the risk factors for osteoporosis. There are several risk factors. They are endocrine causes like hypogonadism, like in premature menopause, anorexia, androgen blockade, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, Cushing's disease, type 1 diabetes, and gastrointestinal causes like celiac disease, chronic liver disease, chronic pancreatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatological causes like rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory arthropathies, and other causes like immobility, multiple myeloma, hemoglobinopathies, and CKD. And drugs causing osteoporosis, they are glucocorticoids, hormone excess, uh, and aromatase inhibitors for the treatment of breast cancer, Thiazolidinedions used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, pioglitazone, antidepressants, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, antipsychotic drugs, anxiolytic drugs, benzodiazepines, sedatives, H2 receptor antagonists, and proton pump inhibitors. Now you can see most of the drugs we use day in our day-to-day -day practice. So we have to keep in our mind about the risk of osteoporosis. Um, and in our patient, there were two risk factors. They are early menopause at 40 years, which was not treated with HRT, and family history of fragile fracture of her mother. Proposed clinical investigations to consider for the investigation of osteoporosis or fragile fractures are full blood count, ESR, serum calcium, phosphate, albumin, creatine, creatine alkaline phosphatase and liver transaminases and serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D and thyroid function tests. Baba, to exclude. Then uh, about fracture risk assessment tools. Uh, there are uh, we use the FRAX tool. It can be performed without with or without bone mineral density measurement. And there is another uh, score called Q fracture score. It doesn't need bone mineral density measurement. Uh, in FRAX assessment, it is uh, used to assess 40 to 90 year age group 
and Q fracture score covers 30 to 99 years of age group. Both, uh, both assessment tools provide information on 10-year probability of hip or other osteoporotic fracture. Fracture assessment should be performed in any postmenopausal woman or men age more than 50 years with the clinical risk factor for fragility fracture to guide bone mineral density measurement and prompt timely referral and or drug treatment where indicated. When using FRAX to calculate the probability of fracture, clinical judgment is needed when clinical risk exceeds those factors able to enter into the FRAX. These are the clinical risk factors included specifically in the FRAX assessment of fracture probability. They are age, sex, BMI, previous fragile fracture, parental history of hip fracture, current glucocorticoid treatment, current smoking, alcohol, rheumatoid arthritis, secondary causes of osteoporosis, including type 1 diabetes, long-standing untreated hyperthyroidism, untreated hypogonadism or premature menopause less than 45 years, chronic malnutrition or malabsorption, chronic liver disease, non-dialysis, chronic renal failure, and femoral neck BMD. These are the clinical risk factors for osteoporosis or fractures not accommodated in FRAX, which should trigger fracture risk assessment. They are thoracic kyphosis, height loss more than 4 cm, falls and frailty, inflammatory diseases, SLE, endocrine disease, Cushing's disease, hematological disorders or malignancy, muscle disease, lung disease, HIV, neurological or psychiatric disease, nutritional deficiencies, bariatric, bariatric surgery and other conditions associated with intestinal malabsorption and medications. These are the indications for vertebral fracture assessment. Vertebral fracture assessment is indicated in postmenopausal women and men age more than 50 if there is a history of more than 4 cm height loss or kyphosis, recent or current long-term oral glucocorticoid therapy, BMD T-score less than point two, two, less than minus 2.5 at either the spine or hip, or in cases of acute onset back pain with risk factors for osteoporosis, like in our patient. She has a history of acute onset back pain with two risk factors for osteoporosis. When we do the clinical risk factors, then uh, we uh, then fracture probability. Uh, then if it is low risk, no need to do any action. And if the patient has intermediate risk, we have to measure BMD and again reassess the probability. If, we, if she is having high risk, then we have to treat and measure the BMD. And if it is very high risk, we have to treat and consider referral to secondary care. This is the lifestyle advices for treatment of osteoporosis. They are adequate nutrition, uh, high protein, vitamin D and calcium containing diet, maintain a bone min uh, BMI of more than 19, adequate in intake of calcium, vitamin D, regular muscle strengthening exercises, stop smoking, reduce alcohol consumption, fall prevention and fall risk assessment and back discipline and about the pharmacological treatment. These are the treatment we can start in primary care. They are oral and IV bisphosphonate, hormone replacement therapy, denosumab, raloxifen, calcitriol, strontium ralinate. If denosumab or calcitriol started in primary care, consultation from a secondary care clinician should be done. About the bisphosphonates, Bisphosphonates are the most cost-effective drug for osteoporosis. Uh, commonly, we use alendronic acid. It is a oral preparation. We give it 70 mg once weekly. We have instructions for use are take on empty stomach uh, first thing in the morning and more than 30 minutes before food or any other medication. Take in an upright position, wash down with plenty of water. Then sit upright for 30 minutes after taking. 
there are co uh, common side effects are upper GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, bowel disturbance, headache, and musculoskeletal pain. So we can, can give some antacids with uh, alendronate. And there are some rare side effects. Although they are rare, they are very serious side effects. They are atypical femoral fracture and osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we have to safety net the patient about the symptoms of atypical femoral fractures like atypical uh, thio groin pain, any uh, atypical jaw or dental pain. Uh, we have to ask the patient to come immediately to the hospital. Uh, before starting alandronate, we have to uh, refer the patient to the dental clinic if she is having any dental problems. And we have to avoid any major dental procedures while on alandronate treatment. And uh, if, uh, if there are any major procedures to be done, they should be done before starting bisphosphonates. And about solandronate, it is an IV preparation. It is given 5 mg once yearly should be given by IV infusion. And it is first line following a hip fracture. These are the contraindications for bisphosphonate therapy. They are hypocalcemia, hypersensitivity to bisphosphonates, pregnancy and lactation, oral bisphosphonates, abnormalities of esophagus that delay esophageal emptying, like stricture or achalasia, and inability to stand for 30, 30 to 60 minutes, and renal impairment. This is how we have to monitor while on oral bisphosphonates. If patient is aged more than 70 or previous hip fracture, or two or more vertebral fractures, or current glucocorticoid use, we have to start bisphosphonate and counsel the patient for 10 years of treatment. Then check treatment tolerance after, after 12 to 16 weeks. Then check adherence after one year of treatment. Then reassess fracture risk if free fracture occurs or clinical risk factors change. Example, start glucocorticoids or otherwise no later, no later than after five years of treatment. At five years, we have to reassess about the adherence, secondary causes of osteoporosis, and choice of treatment. Then continue treatment for another five years. After 10 years of treatment, decisions regarding ongoing management must be made on an individual basis in careful consultation with the patient. Specialist advice may need to be sought. For IV bisphosphonates, we have to assess, assess in uh, three years. And we can continue treatment for uh, if needed for another three years. And after six years of treatment, decision regarding ongoing management must be made on an individual basis in careful consideration with the patient. Specialist advice may need to be sought. About hormone replacement therapy, it is limited for treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis to younger, that is less than 60 years of age, postmenopausal women who have low baseline risk of adverse malignant and thromboembolic events. Then about teriparatide, it is the first line treatment option in postmenopausal women and men aged men age more than 50 who are at high fracture risk, especially vertebral fractures. It is a subcutaneous injection. About denosumab, it is given as a subcutaneous injection as 60 mg once every six months. Avoid unplanned cessation because it can lead to increased vertebral fractures. So don't stop without considering an alternative therapy. If stopped, IV solandronate is recommended six months after the last injection. Then raloxifene, it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It inhibits bone resorption and vertebral fracture risk only. It is taken orally as a single daily 60 mg dose. Then strontium ranulate. It is weak anti-resorptive effect whilst maintaining bone formation. Dose is 2 grams once at night by mouth as suspension of granules stirred in water at least 
two hours after food or consumption of calcium containing products. Common side effects are nausea, diarrhea, high thromboembolism risk. Contraindications are previous MI and strokes. Indications for repeat DEXA scan. We have to consider repeat DEXA scan if fragility fractures on treatment or if considering a change in treatment or if when considering restarting therapy after a drug holiday. Then we have to know how, when we have to refer to the secondary care. These are the indications to referral to secondary care. The presence of single but important clinical risk factors such as a recent vertebral fracture within the last two years, two or more vertebral fractures when they have occurred and BMD T score less than minus 3.5. Treatment with high dose glu glucocorticoids more than 7.5 mg per day of prednisolone or equivalent over three months. The presence of multiple clinical risk factors, particularly with the recent fragility fracture, indicating high imi imminent risk of free fracture or other indicators of very high fracture risk. So the, my take-home message is, as primary care clinicians, should always have in their mind the possibility of vertebral fractures in postmenopausal women and men aged more than 50 years who present with acute back pain, especially thoracic pain, if they have risk factors for osteoporosis. For the first contact care, we can assess the fracture risk of patients with risk factors as opportunistic health prevention. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for the guidance provided. Hello. Uh, sorry. Right. Sorry. Uh, I have muted. Sorry. Uh, actually, Madam. Oh, thank you so much for your uh, the, the 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 very very informative, very much informative lecture, the, the presentation that I know that you have worked hard for this presentation and you have gained knowledge. And you have been the given that knowledge to your colleagues as well. So thank you so much. The, my, I have to add in something to your take home message before I hand over to Chulika. You know um, that you know the the patients are being missed very much with osteoporosis. The most with the postmenopausal ladies come with they come with back pain, right? sort of acute back pain or sort of a chronic back pain having osteoporosis but not thought about the possibility of osteoporosis they just to think about the musculoskeletal and you know they uh, sometimes they thought about uh, you know, the neuropathic pain and all without listening properly so you have to listen to your patient properly right get the nature of the back pain Right, that is not you know the wearing equally throughout the day that it's there and getting worse with the moments. And as well as the past medical history, fragility factors, post menopause, other risk factors like alcohol smoking and then lack of exercises, you have to detect from the history and exclude any other possible diseases like hyperthyroidism, inflammatory bowel diseases. Right, arthropathies, 
those are the common things even though actually you know the red out so many reasons we they to have you know those to age in is the respect post menopausal age for a lady so and even not among the, only the ladies men also because if they got some you know the lack of they are the gonadotropin they, they are prone to get so with aging they also can get it so after that you have to examine the back and you know the assess the back pain back examination you do the correctly they come to the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis then after that you have to just you can you know the get the clinical confirmation by you know the excluding some other diseases like esr doing esr for malignancy and all but can confirm it clinically and according to clinical picture by doing uh, you know the x ray of lumbosacral spine and the lower thoracic spine you can nicely see very much you know the dull you know the margins only showing the margins only and the vertebral bodies are very much dull it's a black in color so that is because of no uh, bone mass so that after that you can suspect you know the having that the osteoporosis with clinical symptoms you can proceed to do the dexa scan so that is how you have to and meantime you exclude other possible risk factors like thyroid functions and uh, possibility of other diseases which i have mentioned okay then after that only you have to think about the management although uh, iv solendronic acid also available we are commonly using in primary care the alendronic so you have to correctly you know give the uh, advices to how to take it and as well as to anticipate the, the gastric irritation with giving by supplementary Uh, PPI on that day, particular one day treatment, then you can give the PPI as well. So like that, you have to continue. But the con the assessment, while assessment, if the patient comes with another severe back pain, then you have to do the again the DEXA scan and the X-ray. And indications actually told for the secondary case, DEXA scan shows the T score is more than minus three point five. Of course, we have to. transfer the hand over the patient to secondary care other than that we can manage right so identify the high risk patients having vertebral factors and identify the low risk uh, moderate risk to high risk patients by uh, you know the having osteoporosis and the t score so accordingly you have to manage so having that knowledge commonly now we uh, you know the we in sri lanka Uh, for patients not only with osteoporosis for other patients also vitamin d supplement so because of that i thought of giving knowledge about that vitamin d supplement for your uh, the knowledge about vitamin d supplement so the so, doctor cholika as a part of therapy to you know common therapy to osteoporosis not only that others also prescribing so i asked them to give that knowledge so cholika is ready to give that knowledge about what vitamin d3 is and how it helps okay so let me show it to you now thank you madam okay and uh, remember that this will be a case as well for your oski or the ospi and as well as mcq so you have to know well in depth about this topic right you start
क्यों नहीं समाती तो प्रॉब्लम क्यों लिखा मुकाबले उत्तर नहीं मिल रहा What is the issue? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about about uh, vitamin D uses in GP practice. I'm Dr. Chulika Vijayathilaka. I was attached to uh, base hospital Pandudra as a registrar in family medicine. A little bit about uh, history of the vitamin D. In 1990, records uh, due to deficiency of dietary factor and lack of sunlight was identified. In 1922, American researchers discovered a substance in cod liver oil and its structures is determined in 1935. Uh, Where share Can you see my? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for, okay. for the disturbance. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about vitamin D uses in GP practice. Yeah, a little bit about the history of vitamin D. In 1919, they have found out that Rickers is due to deficiency of dietary factors and lack of sunlight. In 1922, American researchers discovered the substance in cod liver oil and its, and its structure was determined in 1935. It was called vitamin D, the fourth vitamin. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. It's, it present in animals, plants, and yeast. has several, several important functions in the body. Technically, should be considered as homo. It is synthesized by the body uh, skin from sunlight when there is UVB sun rays. Its wavelength about 290 to 315 nanometers. It is transported by blood and activated. Then acts on specific receptors that, and the target tissue. Feedback regulation of vitamin D occurs via plasma calcium level and active form of vitamin D. It's a fat-soluble vitamin present in animals, plants and yeast has several important functions in the body. Technically should be considered as a home. It's going back. Sorry for it's going back. Vitamin D is a chemically there are two forms available. Vitamin D2 is ergocalciferol. Vitamin D3 is cholecalciferol. Natural form of vitamin D for man and animals is vitamin D3. 
it is produced in body from cholesterol and 7-dehydrocholesterol. Vitamin D2 is commercial, commercially prepared from of ergosterol present in yeast. Molecular structure of vitamin D is closely allied to that of the classical steroid hormones. So skin and diet, it, it, it stores as 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, that is calcidiol. Active form is 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. Uh, it is called uh, as calcitriol. Action steroid hormone binds to receptors in the nucleus to upregulate gene expression in target cells. The prevalence of vitamin D deficiency among adults, it's a, in globally, it is 50%. In regional, uh, regional wise in uh, Southeast, uh, South Asia, it's about 67%. In Sri Lanka, it is 58.8%. Nearly 6 out of 10 people in Sri Lanka are vitamin D deficient. And more than 3 out of 10 people in Sri Lanka are vitamin D insufficient. Less than 1 out of every 10 people has adequate vitamin D levels. Then, then you can identify the level of the vitamin D status in Sri Lankan population. Daily requirement of vitamin D for children and adults, it is 400 international units or 10 microgram per day. During pregnancy and lactation also its requirement is same, but when it comes to adults over 70 years, they need uh, 800 international units per day. One microgram of vitamin D equals to 40 international units. Vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D status is uh, measured by 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol level. It's half life is two weeks. If it is more than 30, then we can say it as normal. Vitamin D deficiency is considered as, as when the vitamin D levels 21 to 21. 9 nanograms per ml. Vitamin D deficiency is called as when it, the level is less than 20. Severe deficiency is when the vitamin D level less than 10. Risk factors for vitamin D deficiency, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver cell disease, medications that induce cytochrome P450 enzymes, Inherited enzyme defect, seeds of vitamin D metabolism. Uh, it is due to vitamin D dependent records. It's called vitamin D dependent records. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. Age more than 65 years. When uh, with aging, uh, vitamin D production on the skin is less uh, due to uh, aging. The production is uh, less compared to the uh, young people with the sun uh, with sun rays uh, falling on the skin even though the adults get the same amount of sun exposure the production of vitamin d is less in adults if they if they are more than 65 years obesity nursing home residents people with dark skin and those who are with less sun exposure due to the changing in lifestyle People, uh, the kids and the adults are more uh, like to work in indoors and less uh, outdoor exercises. So the last, less sun exposure and the vitamin D production is also less. Strict vegetarian diet and exclusive prolonged breastfeeding. The kids who are breast for prolonged periods, they get less vitamin D and tend to have vitamin D deficiency and their walking is delayed and uh, milestones are get delayed due to that. This is the how the production of vitamin D with the exposure of the skin to the sunlight. 7-D hydrocholesterol is converted into 3-D3 and D it converted into D3. D3 is absorbed into the blood and it gets into the, after it getting into the liver, it uh, hydro, uh, 25 hydroxylation occurs. 
after getting into the kidney 125 with one alpha uh, one alpha hydroxylation it is converted to 125 dihydroxy cholecalspiral uh, action of the vitamin d it has, it has several actions on the intestine it, it increases absorption of calcium and phosphate in uh, on bone it increases bone mineralization immune cells induces differentiation and tumor microenvironment it has a function it inhibits proliferation and inhibits induces differentiation of the tumor cells and inhibits angiogenesis the from the diet we get uh, uh, we get calcium uh, the vitamin d sources and it gets into the blood cells uh, blood from there it goes into the skin of with the vitamin d3 with those vitamin d3 also uh, after hydroxylation it gets into the active form causes of vitamin d deficiency liver disease renal disease obesity metabolic syndrome insulin resistance decrease absorption of the vitamin d due to irritable bowel diseases uh, uh, then bowel bypass surgery, fat and add, cholesterol absorption inhibitors, and inability to process vitamin D due to, due to enzyme defects, and inadequate sun exposure, limited outdoor activities, clothing, and sunscreen. Uh, symptoms, children delay in walking, prefer to sit down for prolonged periods, bowing of legs, and it can manifest as rickets in children. Adults, muscle ache and pains, periosteal bone pain with firm pressure on sternum or tibia or osteomalacia. The other association with vitamin D deficiency, infections, tuberculosis, COVID-19, endocrine diseases, type 2 diabetes, and neurological disorders, multiple sclerosis, dermatological diseases, psoriasis. And then uh, went to uh, order the vitamin D level assay. Now it has become a fashion to uh, order vitamin D levels. It's a very expensive test. Even NICE says uh, there is no need to do the vitamin D assay. There is no uh, symptom if the patient is not symptomatic or established metabolic bone disease. According to guideline, established metabolic, uh, the indication for the testing of vitamin D are established metabolic bone disease. Example, primary postmenopausal osteoporosis, osteoporosis secondary to other medical conditions and or drugs, primary hyperparathyroidism, suspected osteomalacia, medical conditions predisposing to uh, vitamin D deficiency, celiac disease, and the Asian pregnant women, yeah, according to their guideline, we are very vulnerable for the vitamin D deficiency. Patients receiving high potent antireceptive agents such as intravenous bisphosphates or denosumab or when the scan indicates the need for check vitamin D status. Proximal muscle weakness and musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, according to their guideline, uh, the NICE guideline, the uh, recommended vitamin D treatment, uh, inter uh, if the vitamin D levels are more than 50, it is, uh, these levels are taken as nanomoles per liter. The, if it is more than 50, maintain vitamin D, D through safe sun for exposure and diet. Then they don't need uh, vitamin D supplement. If the level is uh, uh, between 30 to 50, if one or more of following applies, fragility fracture, osteoporosis, high risk fracture, risk, drug treatment for bone disease, symptoms suggestive of vitamin D deficiency, increased risk of developing vitamin D deficiency, such as reduced UV exposure, raised parathyroid hormone, treatment with anticonvulsants scent or glucocorticoids, malabsorption, then they have to be treated. 
if the rapid correction is needed if there are symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. That is colic alciferol 50,000 units once a week for six weeks. And then comes the maintenance. Maintenance is given as colic alciferol 1,000 units per day. Uh, if their level is less than 30, we don't have to consider their other risk and we can straight away start the uh, treatment. Uh, then uh, thereafter, we can, uh, after the uh, correction, we have to assess the uh, calcium levels and continue with the maintenance dose. Elective correction is indicated when co-prescribing with vitamin D supplements with an oral antireceptive agent, that is alandronate-like treatment. Then we can co-prescribe vitamin D supplementary dose, that is 1,000 units according to the guideline. Vitamin D treatment available preparations, ergocalciferol is calciferol, D2, colicalciferol, uh, is D3 simple? It is being given for the simple v vitamin D deficiency. It's for 400 units per day. Uh, these are taken from the BNF. Uh, the previous protocol was from the NICE guideline. According to the BNF, uh, there is less sun exposure and deficient diet. We can go up to the uh, go uh, vitamin D. 3 up to 800 international units to 1000 international units per day. If not responding, we can combine with calcium in high risk of uh, osteoporosis. With patients with severe renal impairment, we can recommend alpha calcidol, that is 1 alpha hydroxycholic alcidol. It's being given as oral and injection preparations are available. Maintenance dose is 0.25 to 1 microgram per day. Other preparation is calcitriol. It is 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol. It's also available as oral preparations and injections. Its maintenance is 0.5 to 1 microgram per day. It's been licensed for the postmenopausal osteoporosis also. Then Pericalcitriol is a synthetic vitamin D analog. It's been licensed for prevention and treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism associated with chronic renal failure. When prescribing pharmacological doses of uh, vitamin D, we have to uh, as, uh, as a, arrange the serum calcium level as a and side effects of overdose uh, vit vitamin D are anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and constipation, weight loss, polyuria and thirst. When we are treating with high doses of uh, vitamin D, we have to be conscious about those side effects. Then lifestyle measures for the vitamin D uh, deficiency or prevention um, Adequate sun exposure is to need to be arranged. It's uh, between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. 50 to 30 minutes of sun exposure for the 25% of the body without sunblock and protective clothing. Dark skin need, people needs prolonged sun exposure. If, for the people who are getting erythema with the... Uh, uh, Five minutes of sun exposure, those people won't need uh, that much of prolonged exposure for the vitamin D production. And uh, they also don't recommend uh, in being in the sun in the mid midday because there's a possibility of skin cancer and eye damage with exposure to heavy sun. Then diet, uh, uh, according to Sri Lankan diet, the small fish like salia, sudia, salmon, and egg milk are the cheap, uh, cheapest varieties.
ചുളിക്കാൻ ചുളിക്കാൻ Julika, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, hari. Who, Julika? You were there. Where is she? Maybe disconnected, madam. Ah, oh, is that so? In the middle of the discussion, Anyway, so I think you got you know, the update knowledge about the vitamin D3 because it's commonly prescribed, no? So you got to know the indications for vitamin D3 dose and the indication for the common, the indications to prescribe. So because of that, that also learning point. And for the, of course, for the this osteoporosis, it needs to be added 1000 IU usually we give 2000 as well so that is for the supplementary uh, to give the bone strength because that is the base calcium uh, but that is 25 hydroxycalciferol so not 1 alpha 1 alpha in case of kidney disease we can't give vitamin D3 because conversion will not be there so because of that, so anyway, uh, management of osteoporosis and the supplementary management with vitamin D3 and all, I hope that you got the knowledge. So because of that, I, uh, my experience is you are going to miss a lot of cases. You are not thought about, uh, you have not thought about the possibility of detection of the osteoporosis as a common prevalent disorder which needs to be get into your mind and then you can you know the, uh, do the surveillance for that only then you will find out. So I, in my Panadura clinic, so many patients, you know, they are being diagnosed as uh, this thing and after two, three months, their back pain will go, right? So because of that, you have to, you know, the educate them as well about the disease process and the uh, drugs management and the uh, slow recovery. But at the same time, you have to provide, you know, the slow massaging and everything to the area that to improve the blood supply. That, you know, the physical exercises, not to give the most to the, the spine or the hip would be better. So that is under the guidance of in the physiotherapist, well-known physiotherapist to avoid these fractures and all, you have to be very careful when you refer to the physiotherapy. So those are the management things. I hope that you will look into that hereafter for the uh, possibility of the, the, for the, for the common prevalence of osteoporosis. So that is what I really wanted to give you. Those keys will come, MCQs will come, and from the FRAC score, and you have to be aware about DEXA scan, FRAC score, and the X ray about osteoporosis. You have to be ready to the exam when you are coming. Okay, not only for the exam, to date itself in thought of management osteoporotic patients correctly with your trainers. Okay. So this is the thing. Any other questions other than that can stop because it's time uh, too late for you all to go to the sleep. Sorry for the disturbance during the presentation. Why? What? No, it's okay. What has happened now?
You have finished, no? Julika. Uh, due to connection error, presentation last only a last slide was available to show it during that uh, it stopped. So now can't do that. Uh, Some mirror. Anyway, that's okay. So don't worry. Thank you. Um, then any other problems? So we can stop other than that. Hope that you got most of the knowledge that you want to you know the I didn't Excuse detect me, madam. The... Yeah. I have a question, madam, regarding the previous uh, presentation. Uh, yes. Earlier we thought it, the duration of this possibility is five years. Now she told that it is now 10 years. Yeah. Uh, about that, madam, uh, now it is recommended to give uh, oral this postponement so 10 years. No, that is, you know, the first, first time once you start the treatment, right? So you, you can go up to five years, right? And, yes, you know, the uh, at the end of five years, you have to stop it and then give uh, the do the uh, DEXA scan again, right? And uh, even if patient needs a holiday, little bit of short holiday, and then you, have, you can go ahead for the another five years, depending on the patient. Okay, madam, yes. Okay. Okay. Read the guideline, then okay. Hmm? Yes, sir. Join which year? Second year, madam. Name? Second year, madam. Name, make a cow. Ah, Taranga, I'm Taranga. Ah, Taranga, right. Okay, Taranga. Mm. Go yes, and read madam. about your. Uh, Oh, the Achini, madam. Oh, yeah, me. Apni gatti nice second me the. Oh, madam, nice latest second gatti. Nice latest guideline. Go and read about that and the general practice handbook of Oxford as well. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Two thousand twenty one guideline, madam. Ah, okay, good. We are managing so many patients, right, with osteoporosis that uh, we have the diagnosed, and we have started treatment. So they are coming, and after about three four months of having treatment continuously, they uh, complain about you know they have very much you know the less complain about the back pain improved a lot and the same time the so one the, when you prescribe this prosponate alendronate you have to be very much careful with the, too many glasses of water ask them to drink and the same time ppi would be better because sometimes when i have seen a patient with severe esophagitis after giving this a GP has given that without any, you know, the advisors and all. So whenever I saw that patient, right, the patient is complaining about the difficulty of eating, right, no taste, can't eat because of the burning sensation or not burning sensation. She says that some sort of discomfort, right. Then when I examine for the epigastric pain or tenderness, it was not there. So, but anyway, it's, it's, you know, the same sort of um, no burps, nothing. Only complaint was she can't you know, eat. And it's sort of a burning along the esophagus. So, you are going to miss the diagnosis because she didn't have epigastric tendons. That is the esophagitis. Okay. When I checked her drugs, one GP has given her you know, uh, the alendronic as if because of her, you know, the when she fell down from height, not from the standard, this are 
ඔකේ ඩිස්ක්‍රයිබ් කරපු නිකන් අපි හිටගෙන ඉන්නකොට තියෙන උසකින් වැටිලා නෙවෙයි උඩකින් වැටිලා පොඩි ෆ්‍රැක්චර් එකක් වුණාම හි හැස් you know the started this thing for 45 years old lady this was when it without giving any instruction so she has taken daily you know three days and ultimately you know fortunately i got that i found the drug and i started you know the iv omeprazole and iv normal saline for three days and then went to oral and uh, ppi then recovered otherwise it will rupture right so because of that you have to be very much careful of giving correct instruction and assess the patient and ask them to pay them you safety net the patient if any sort of the burning sensation and intolerability of the drug please come so that is the learning experience that i got okay so shall we wind up then you may be sleepy and tomorrow you are working day so thank you very much for the two presenters you know achini and as well as chulika for your enthusiasm to share the knowledge with others on behalf of uh, sri lanka college of specialist family physicians i'm dr malkanthi thanking you all lot I wish you all the very best and we'll do the weekly program but for the new year i hope that we will uh, stop till uh, the middle of you know the april after the bypassing new year week we'll we restart again on thursday right with my current trainees current trainees are there so i will come back to you that will be the case scenario right oski exam formats all right thank you thank you madam okay good night good okay. night good night thank you madam sorry for the disturbance for the no no it's all right don't say you have done a good job okay dear bye